Confused by your M-Series Mac? This is Mac Voices. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by the Mac Voices Dispatch, our weekly newsletter to keep you up on all the latest from Mac Voices. Watch or listen to Mac Voices straight from your email client. Sign up at macvoices.com slash newsletter and stay up to date. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, it's been months and months since we talked to Glenn Fleischman. We had to look it up. It's been so long ago. But it seems like just yesterday. I don't know how this happens. But Glenn has written um, several new books. He's updated a bunch of books. We wanted to play catch up, and Glenn agreed. So, Glenn, it's great to have you. Welcome back after way too long an absence. <laughs> Always happy to be back. Apparently, uh, you know, time flies when you're in pandemic, I guess, is the uh, the problem. I, I, Listen, I, I would have given I, – I thought it was six or eight weeks maybe, but it's all the way back in September of last year. So I can't figure out what happened. I but, guess we're keeping busy. Yeah. That's a good part. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So I, I, I think we'll start out with the most recent book, and that is Take Control of Your M-Series Max, with Mac, which is, of course, right at the moment, the mini – or one of the laptops, but there are all kind of rumors that we may be adding to that collection soon. So, so why? What, what do we need to know about the M series Mac that isn't kind of obvious that we don't just open it up, hit the button, and go? Well, I think it's a good book to start with in the series. But the uh, the funny part is, I wrote the book because in uh, writing securing your Mac, it turned out we just kept finding all these exceptions. It's like, oh yeah, this is true. Oh, but not if you're on an, on an M1. Oh, this is not if you're on an M1. I'm like, wait, how do we do that on an M1? And then in February, <laughs> Apple released its uh, platform security guide, which is intended for more technical types. You know, it's meant for like system administrators and IT people and and uh, you know folks working doing Apple support. Uh, but it was widely read because it actually had a fair amount of detail in it that Apple had not revealed before and they've changed terminology on some things and there's a lot of m1 detail in there that wasn't released when the m1s were in november so uh i'd have to say the m series book arose directly out of like okay if i look at everything <laughs> just on the securing side like uh you know dealing with boot level security and all that kind of stuff that's half the book and it, and it is because there's a lot of m m1 specific stuff um but it's also things that we think of as um you know, long-term Mac OS or Mac behavior that we're totally used to is now different in an M1 Mac. And, uh, you know, Joe Kissel and I are confident, as is everyone, that M1 means that there's going to be a two and three and four in some sequence to come. So we figured this is the right time to start. And we're calling it, you know, take control of your M series Mac. We're being ambitious because we have no inside knowledge. We just can count numbers. Uh, so we figure we'll start with the M1, but I wrote it in such a way that as, you know, future versions or, you know, if the M1 is the chip for the next couple of years and there are different Macs, we'll expand it to include that. And if it's the next one is the M2 or the M3, or if there's an M4 Pro or whatever, uh, we'll incorporate that, incorporate that as well. Um, but I think, you know, some of the big issues are around uh, how, you well, I guess you know we start with migrating because most people will already have obviously an Intel-based Mac, and there's a number of issues there, and kind of working with Rosetta 2, the emulation layer that Apple offers uh, for 64-bit Intel apps inside of Mac OS. Um, so that's one thing, and that winds up being a little more involved than at first glance. Uh, and then there's just a lot of stuff around. Um, just issues about how do you you know back up the computer? What happens? You know, you don't do command. R on startup anymore to enter what's now called seemingly recovery OS it was called Mac OS recovery, but in the Apple platform security guide, it's almost uniformly referred to as recovery OS. Uh, so, you know, what, you know, even that, like, what do I do? If I hold down the option key at startup, nothing happens. If I hold down command R, nothing happens. Uh, I want to share my disk, use target disk mode on my M series Mac. And it's, Oh, it's not, it doesn't work that way. You know, I, I can't reboot holding the T key down. So there's all these, you know, and there's even things like a battery life, which is not unique to the M one chip, but because it is so much more battery life uh, relative to previous entrants, you know, I think it, I mean, people talk about it. I forget what it's measured at. Is it 50% more or something, but it feels practically infinite. You know, I think you could probably uh, fly 17 hours, you know, go from here to Australia or something and not have to recharge your M1 Mac if you were careful with it. Uh, and that's insane. So I have a whole chapter just on kind of 
thinking about the battery, monitoring it, using Apple's tools, understanding how to deal with like super extended battery life. Because before we used to have to work so hard to preserve it. And now it's kind of a, a different thing, um, you know, and then into things like, uh, you know, recovery, like we dig into recovery OS, uh, there's security issues and, um, you know, what Big Sur is like. Big Sur is even somewhat different in a number of ways on uh, an M1 Mac. That is to say, it's the same operating system, but under the hood, there are a few different things that are done uh, with an M1 Mac than there are with an Intel Mac, even though to all appearances, you're running the same operating system. Um, and then some fun stuff like, you know, how do you, you know, managing iOS and iPadOS apps, since you can run those natively now, and uh, even like kind of a preview of what it's like to run Windows, uh, which I've got up and running and is a really weird experience. Um, have you installed the par Parallels, just as we're recording this, Parallels released the 16.5 update to Parallels uh, desktop for macOS. So it's the official native version that is M1 and Intel compatible. So uh, if you get the Windows ARM release from uh, Microsoft through its uh, insider program you have to join, you can run Windows for ARM inside Parallels on your M1, and then you can run Intel apps for Windows in the emulator in Windows in your virtual machine on your M1. <laughs> Which I need is, a diagram of that. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I should add that to the next edition. It's kind of hilarious. But so that's the, that's the scope of the book. Is, is there's just all these little things that people who like you and I, who are longtime Mac users, um, it's uh, not, I wouldn't say it's frustrating, but it's a little a little complicated because stuff isn't where you expect to find it. So in part, it's a reintroduction. Like, hey, this thing you want to do, here's how you do it now. And the other is like, hey, here's these new features that did not exist before, and how to manage them or to cope with them if they're uh, if they're getting in your way. Wow, there's I mean, there's a lot there. And I know I've had my own experiences with the M ones and you know, they've for the most part they've been positive, but I do find myself occasionally having to try to find some information on how do I do this, how do I do that. The the, the one the biggest question I think that well, for me anyway, so I'm gonna make this all about me, right? Um, but the the whole booting from an external drive thing seems to be a bit more of a challenge. Um, I, I know you just wrote uh, an article about how an SSD gave your old iMac a new yeah. life. Um, and so I know one of the challenges I have is, you know, the, the storage, because for better or worse, not knowing what I was getting into, I just bought the minimum configuration. Now, I would ideally like to boot from an external Mac, but I find the experience, even with a, with a fa relatively fast SSD, is kind of inconsistent. Yeah. Am I alone in that or am I doing something wrong? I don't think you're alone at all because Apple made uh, two big changes. So you're dealing both with the uh, migration from Catalina to Big Sur and Big Sur has a different approach to how it protects the system. And then also the Intel to M1 migration, which treats the boot process differently. So uh, in Catalina, you know, the system, all the system files and the uh, data files, your own files, were separated out. So when you upgraded to Catalina or you started with a Catalina native system, uh, native Mac, uh, this was an issue for some people because it was kind of, it was confusing if you were digging down and sometimes people had problems with it. But there's basically an immutable read-only volume that has all the system files. And so even if you're the, you know, the root owner of a system, if you're using Unix, if you're digging in, you can't make any change, changes while Catalina is running and all your data is on a separate volume. And so Apple added this volume groups concept inside of the APF, APFS filing system that they upgraded us all to a few releases ago, right? So with Moh Mojave, uh, got fusion drives. They're the last ones that uh, migrated to using AP uh, APFS. In APFS, you can use containers on a drive that uses APFS. But APFS is organized uh, around this idea of um, containers. You make multiple containers, and each container can have multiple volumes in it. And then Catalina added the idea that you could group volumes together into a seamless entity. So in the Finder, our startup volume looks like one thing, but it's actually a read-only system volume and a read-write data volume. And uh, Apple did a great job of interleaving those. So it looks invisible. Most of the time, it's totally invisible to us. Um, but it was still only part of the migration. So in Big Sur, uh, the startup volume is not only immutable and read-only, but at startup, so Big Sur seals, uh, signs and seals the volume. So it's a, I think it's, I'm saying it right way, it's signed, sealed volume is the concept. So when you install Big Sur, 
or you upgrade Big Sur, uh, there's some interaction uh, with Apple servers and there's some interaction locally and a signature is created for the entire volume. And it's it, this, this whole very complicated tree of cryptographic signatures I don't need to get into for most people never have to deal with this. If you're a security researcher, you're going to look into this. Um, but what it means is that cryptographically, once that installation is complete and Apple's gone, you know, ding, and it's signed off with their certificate, nothing will ever work again in Big Sur if any element of it's changed. So some hacker were to figure out a way to modify your system volume to go in and, you know, corrupt some uh, uh, program, subvert it to their will. Well, when you try to boot up, uh, your Mac is going to say, hey, uh, your system is, is damaged. You need to reinstall Big Sur. So that's great. That's a security issue. Here's how it affects M1 Macs. So uh, with Intel-based Macs, there's a boot ROM that helps manage pr the process. So when you, when you start up your Mac, a boot ROM does a bunch of stuff. And um, this also lets you, at boot time, choose... Well, I'm going to start up from uh, uh, another volume. I've got a different drive attached, and I'm going to start up from an external drive. And it's very straightforward. You can hold down the option key. You can use startup disk. Uh, you've got all these options, right? And that's all. That's what we're used to. That's probably what you're used to. You know, it's a very simple thing. Uh, and if you have uh, File Vault enabled on an Intel machine, it actually boots first into recovery OS, into a special partition on your startup volume, whichever volume you set as your startup, and you have to log in there. And it, that unlocks the key that then, or it unlocks and with the T2 chip on the, those Intel devices with T2 security chips, it's a little different, but it basically unlocks your access to that Mac and the Mac starts up. So here's the thing, with an M1 Mac, the change along with Big Sur is that M1 Macs don't boot from a special partition. If you have File Vault enabled uh, or disabled, the disk is still encrypted all the time. That's also true of Intel machines with T2 security chips. Your hard drive, or your, sorry, your SSD rather, is always encrypted. So when it's at rest, it's in a state of super protection, right? What File Vault does on an M1 machine, though, <clears throat> it allows the M1 machine to start up from Big Sur's system volume. So there's no special recovery startup process to log in. So it starts up from that. And at that point, if File Vault's enabled, you still have to enter an account password and then it immediately loads the data files. It unlocks the data drive and you're in Mac OS. So that's great. It's like one fewer step, one fewer thing that goes wrong. Um, but that's a major change. Here's the other major change though. There's no boot ROM as such in an M1 Mac. So there's firmware that controls the secure enclave and some other components. And then there's stuff on an SSD. The internal SSD has additional partitions that are never installed on an external drive. So if you erase your internal drive in an M1, you're actually not erasing everything on the drive. You're actually erasing the stuff that Apple wants you to. If you erased everything on it, then you have a whole other thing at hand that I talk about in the book about to dealing with. So when you use an external drive to start up with on an M1 Mac, because of these changes, uh, you ha it actually first essentially consults in this boot process, it consults the internal drive to check the policy that's been set up to allow an external drive to boot. And if that passes, it's great. And it says terrific. And it boots up off the startup, uh, off the startup volume on the external drive. If it doesn't, if there's something different, sometimes you have to go through another process. You have to almost anoint that external drive. So you get, it takes you into recovery OS. You enter some information, you know, you're, you're validate yourself, you authenticate yourself, and only then will it restart and let you start into the external drive. So uh, Joe and I had this actually, not a battle, but when we were editing, he said, I don't have this problem. I can just start up for an external drive. And I said, no, but the first time you try to start up from any external drive, you typically have to go through a round trip where you set security policy or you authenticate yourself, then subsequently that policy is stored on the internal drive and it allows you to boot an external drive. Have I lost you that? This is a little complicated. It's not the way an Intel Mac works at all. I, no, I think, I think <laughs> it, it makes a certain amount of sense if you accept the fact that security is a, a much higher priority now than it's ever been yeah. before built That's into it. the OS. So. That's it. But the round trip explains some of what I felt was inconsistency. Um, and so, so, so if I'm trying to boot 
Well, let me back up. So an M1 Mac cannot boot from a Catalina drive. Is that a correct statement? Yeah, M1 Mac can't boot from, I think it's in 11.1 is the first release. That may be wrong there. I think it's 11.1 is required. A Big Sur 11.1 is required to boot an M1. Uh, you cannot boot from an external drive that has running Big Sur 11.1 or later if the boot drive was set up on an Intel machine. You have to set the drive up. You have to erase it and either install Big Sur from an M1 directly onto the drive or use uh, Carbon Copy Cloner is the only app I think right now that'll do it to copy the signed, sealed Big Sur volume on your M1 machine to an external drive. So those are the only two ways you can get an M1 to boot off an external drive. So you can't have a, an external bootable drive that will boot both Intel and M1 systems. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So that's sense. one thing. <laughs> that Well, yeah, but I mean, again, it, it, it starts to make a little more sense as to what I've been seeing. So, right. yeah, so exactly. I have to have that external SSD prepped right. with Big Sur. Yeah, and conceivably, every time you want to update it. Now, starting in Big Sur 11.3, which isn't out as we record this, uh, Carbon Copy Cloner, the Bombitch software folks, say that Apple did update the utility that they need. So starting with the next release, uh, so up until now, from 11.1 into the latest 11.2.3, uh, if you wanted to use an external drive and keep Big Sur up to date, you had to, you couldn't just copy a new copy of Big Sur onto that external drive when it already had a copy there. You had to boot into that drive, run an update on that drive. So that's kind of a hassle. If you're already keeping your internal drive updated, now you have to also keep your external drive updated. You can't just clone it. Well, starting with 11.3, Bombich says they can just copy the signed seal volume correctly from your M1's internal drive to any external drive. And that's gonna you know, still take a little more time than just updating certain files, but that's gonna make a big difference in terms of if you need an external bootable drive, then that will make it a lot simpler with, with Carbon Copy Cloner. Okay, so if, cause I'm thinking- We started about, with the hardest thing, Chuck. This is the hardest one. Well, okay, so maybe I can back it down because I guess yeah. I'm thinking of, of the average user who is has bought one of these M1 Macs and whether whatever it is, and they want to do the migration, yeah, okay. They, and, oh and yeah, I mean, let me let me interrupt one second. Which is that what we just described? If you never want to boot off an external drive, you never have to deal with this with an M1 Mac. It's complicated, but most people I think will never boot off an external drive. What they want to be able to do is maybe they want a bootable clone, and I talk about how to do that in the book. And that's not actually that hard, but maybe they just want to have all their data backed up because there's less necessity now to back up the system volume because it's it's identical. It's it's a different kind of animal. So anyway, I just want to say most people who don't have external bootable needs, I mean, essentially most people don't have the need to boot off an external drive, I think. And if that's the case, then this won't affect you at all. Uh, you never have to deal with this issue. Okay, and that's and that's great. So I guess and and part of my thing has been that I've wanted to migrate from what my Intel system uh, yeah. in Catalina over to Big Sur. So the question becomes for those folks who are buying an M1 and they're going to move everything over and, and have the the M1 be their main machine. What's the easiest, best, safest way to do it? Because I personally would have thought, okay, I will just take um, my Catalina drive. I'll boot into it, or excuse me, scratch that. I will attach it to the M1 Mac with a clone of my Catalina system on it, and then I would install Big Sur over it. And that doesn't sound yeah, like so that's the best way to do it. No, I mean, I would say, well, so you want, if you're starting, I mean, so that's the question. If you want to have an external drive that's driving your M1, then you're still going to be in the same place. Like, I think what's what's complicated is this data system split that starts in Catalina. And so I would. I mean, I think I would in that scenario, if I'm trying, if I'm not trying to, so, I mean, there's two scenarios, right? There's one is I'm migrating uh, my files from an Intel Mac or an external drive to my M1 Mac's internal drive. And that's relatively straightforward, right? And that just works. You just, I mean, just works, I say, but you use migration assistant, assistant you import it and uh, the M1 Mac takes all the files and puts them where they should. And it's not a big deal, uh, assuming that goes well. Um, with, uh, and I'm told that I think it's 1123, there were some, some people were having issues with migration assistant and, uh, someone who'd, uh, contacted Joe and I about a problem they were having 
they said some recent updates seem to solve the problem and suddenly migration assistant is working for them. They're having uh, you know beach balling and now they can migrate uh, files, which is great because that's what you want. Um, if you've got an external drive, that's what you've been using as your startup drive, then you're going to need to boot into the M1 uh, from its internal drive and then run the installer. Well, there's two options. If you've got carbon copy cloner, you could conceivably yeah, see, this is where it gets, I'm like, I'm getting complicated <laughs> in my head because um, uh, you need to install Big Sur either from scratch or copy a version of it over. But if you have an existing drive that worked with an Intel system, you can't just copy it over. So in fact, in the scenario you're describing, you would almost need to duplicate that drive, erase it, run the installer or use Carbon Copy Cloner on your M1 Mac, then migrate the data over to that drive. So it's not as simple as it sounds because that, because that drive cannot simply be updated to work from everything I can tell. Uh, and I'm leaning a lot on uh, Howard Oakley at Eclectic Light who documents a lot of these low level system things. He's written a lot about the new sort of boot and uh, sealed volume issues. And it does not sound as if you can just migrate an Intel oriented drive formatted correctly. I mean, APFS and everything the same. You can't just migrate that to be an external bootable uh, M1 compatible drive. You actually have to erase it and reinstall or recopy the system volume. Okay. Got it. So that's Got more it. complicated. Like I say, I don't think most people will face that. I think if you're in, and this is that problem, right? Is that Apple, because it has fixed storage on all of its models now, if you say, oh, I got a 256 gig thing and really I need 512 or a terabyte, what are you going to do? You got to get a new machine because, um, you know, for a desktop, it's easier, you know, if you've got a Mac mini and you were, and you said, I'm, I'm going to go on the low end there because Apple charges too much for SSD storage and I'm going to get a two terabyte external drive for it and boot off that. That's fine because you're, you know, you're going to be using that reliably. You're not taking it around. You don't have to plug and unplug it. And that just becomes your boot volume. But for, um, laptops, I think it's really critical to figure out the right amount. And if you make a mistake with it, it may make more sense to bite the bullet and sell it and upgrade um, than try to manage an external volume. Unless it's much bigger. Like if you need a two terabyte or four terabyte volume with a laptop, then you're going to, you know, you're not going to go to Apple for that. But if you're looking for one terabyte versus 512 gigs, I think like actually exchanging out the laptop is the better choice long-term. Okay. You said you kind of passed over the, something for the next question because it's the other important thing is can we have a bootable backup with the M1s because that becomes like hypercritical if, uh, if if anything goes wrong, you know, with our internal, either from not just a system standpoint, but, you know, the inevitable thing, and we'll talk about securing your Mac in a minute, but, you know, something goes wrong, so a bug gets in there or a virus gets in and you need to go back to a clone. Um, is are there any challenges there, or does that work pretty much the same way that it has up to this point? No, I mean this is the same problem. If you want to, you can make an external clone, external blue. You can make an external bootable M1 clone, um, and the issue is really has been again until uh, Big Sur 11.3. The issue has been if you wanted to keep that external clone system updated, you had to boot into it and install or upgrade Big Sur on that. So you'd have like an, you know, an hour every time you need to update Big Sur, you got to boot into the external clone from the machine, run the Big Sur installer and let it do its thing. Uh, so Carbon Copy Cloner, starting with the next release of Big Sur, will be able to just copy over an updated Big Sur volume onto your external bootable clone. So that's great. So I'm recommending Carbon Copy Cloner in a kind of broad way. I, in the, you know, in the past, I use Super Duper. Sometimes I use CCC. Sometimes I use Disk Utility and other tools. But right now, I think Bombitch kind of has the right set of tools for managing this, especially on an M1. And uh, I don't know, it may not be worth it for some of the other companies to catch up. I'm not sure because it's a it's a really different animal. And, you know, it's... A, it's there's a decreasing. So here's one thing, and I'll, I'll I'll actually answer your question too. But it's um, there's a decreasing need to have an external bootable clone for for two reasons. Uh, on an Intel or M1 machine, because your Big Sur installation is sealed and signed and so forth, um, it's always going to be identical. So you don't necessarily need uh, a clone. You could just reinstall Big Sur. And it takes a little bit longer, but it may be necessary depending on what happens to your machine when you're trying to boot from the clone to 
restore something. So is the question that you lost data on your internal volume or do your internal drive die? You know, these are questions you ask about whether you need one. Most people are in SSDs now. All the M1 devices are SSD. Um, with an SSD, the odds of the internal drive dying are very low. So maybe you don't need an external bootable clone. Maybe you just clone the data volume and a uh, carbon copy cloner does that, or you can use time machine and it's going to back up, you know, your system so that you can restore it. Um, on the M ones in particular, the issue is that if the internal SSD SSD dies, you cannot start the machine up from an external drive. And that is a, that's a huge, yes. So, right. I see your raised eyebrows. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, that's... It's a huge difference because there are invisible specific partitions maintained on the internal drive, if the drive cannot be read or repaired, uh, then the M1 machine is dead. There's nothing you can do. It has to be repaired, has to have its motherboard replaced. That's it. Um, now, the odds of that happening are really low. It's really low, really odds really low that your SSD will fail on an M1 machine. I mean, very low. And without the entire, because it's soldered onto the board, without the entire motherboard having failed for some reason. So if your computer, if your Mac, your M1 Mac will try to start up, and yet the only thing that's wrong with it is the SSD, then you have to get the whole thing replaced. Um, if uh, in any other scenario, if there's something really wrong, you won't even be able to start up the Mac. And so it's not an issue, but, um, so that's one scenario. Uh, if you happen to accidentally do something that erased the entire internal drive and it's still a working SSD, then there is a process that allows you to reinstall the hidden partitions with another Mac, uh, using a tool called Apple configurator Two. Um, you can restore or revive your Mac. So that's good news. Um, Although, you, you know, that's, it's a very weird scenario. Like you should never fully erase the volume and Apple tries to prevent you from fully erasing the internal volume on an M1 now. What it typically does when you erase, it erases the volume group that contains the system and the data, but it doesn't erase anything else in the drive. So that's a big change, right? Is you can't, so I mean, say it again, if your SSD on your M1 Mac dies, the internal SSD, you cannot boot from an external drive to use it. Okay, so I, I I want to be real clear about this. I hear what yeah. you're saying. I um I don't I wish I had one that I could hold up. So this is the closest thing I have in hand. This is my M1 Mac. My M1 yeah. Mac, the SSD dies. I have made yep. a bootable clone. I cannot boot this machine from that bootable clone. No, you can't. An Apple can't. Nobody can. It's basically a piece of. It's a brick. Okay. But. And it's not, you know, Apple, it's not intentional on Apple's part. It's a security choice because these hidden partitions that are used to manage external drive policy mean that it's, you can't subvert an M1 Mac to convince it in some really weird way to boot off an external drive and give someone access to files. So it's a, it, it's a very high level of security. And I can only wager that Apple feels is either an existing threat that we're not fully aware of or emergent threats that require that um, because it is kind of a government level, government level thing. Like it feels like we're getting into the like unsoldering the SSD off the drive or off the motherboard uh, level of stuff when you get to that point. And uh, someone proved recently, you can carefully unsolder the SSD off an M1 uh, motherboard and replace it. So, you know, you still can't get into a secure enclave safely and, and extract data or it really requires uh, you know, a trillion dollar laser or something. Um, but I, but so I don't know Apple's total motivation here, but so in the past, so again, Intel machine, there's a boot ROM that governs this and it's a ROM. So it doesn't, you know, the ROMs, if it, ROM chip burned out, it'd be really weird. So typically, even if everything's, every drive related thing has failed on your Intel Mac, you can still boot off an external drive. It's still totally useful on an M1 machine because they've replaced the boot ROM essentially with a combination of some stuff that's in firmware related to the secure enclave and some other startup functions that are not, it's not a full boot process and some stuff that's on the SSD. So it's volatile. It has to be read from the SSD because of that, that gives, that's a kind of constrains the ability to bring that Mac back to life. Okay. So, so great. <laughs> I, I, I now have a brick of an, of an M1. All right. Yeah. And so I take it to the trash and throw it in, but I've still got my bootable clone. So does this mean I can still take that bootable clone, plug it into a new M1 Mac and boot? Exactly. Okay. So that still that's works. Oh, 
Oh, well, no. I mean, yes and no. You can, uh, the data volume is fully available. You may not be able, <laughs> you may not be able to, there's a personalization thing. So with the M1 chip and with Big Sur, uh, I haven't tried this yet. I actually don't know anyone who's tried it. It's possible that you may not be able to boot, uh, you may have to change security settings on your Mac in order to boot from an external drive that had its system created or copied from a different M1 Mac. And I don't know the answer to that because I don't have two M1 machines and I haven't read anyone who's tried that. So Apple has a new security manager in Recovery OS that lets you choose between full security and medium security or moderate security. And full security is the default and it locks everything down super tightly and it's what 99.7% of people are gonna use. The moderate security lets you run uh, versions of Mac OS other than the one that was installed on the computer or is the current release. And so I think in that case, in order, so, so your M1 SSD drive dies and you, I hope you, you take it to recycling, you get it repaired or whatever. But while you're waiting for it to repair, you get a loaner unit, you got another M1, you plug in your external bootable drive and it goes at you. You go, wow, oh, what's going on? Let's assume that happens because I think that's what's going to happen. So what you do is you restart into recovery OS you run from the uh, the system utilities. There's a utilities menu. Uh, you select the system security uh, utility and you choose moderate and you uh, have authenticated yourself with an account on the machine that you're running. Then you restart. And at that point, I believe you can then boot off the external bootable clone from the other computer. Um, but it's a whole, again, it's a whole thing because you can imagine I've got an external bootable clone. I can just take it to another computer and boot off it. and you know, that's a big security risk. Someone could just make a bootable clone of your machine or take yours and run off with it. There's a related issue that's complicated that Joe and I have discovered and we're still working out is it doesn't look like you can enable file vault encryption on an external bootable clone. So that means that your external bootable clone does not have the same level of protection as your internal drive, which is always on with encryption. So if someone gets a hold of your external bootable clone, it is an unencrypted drive with all your information on it. You can't turn encryption on it at a drive level. You can't turn encryption on with File Vault, not yet. So I'm waiting to see if 11.3 uh, addresses this, because that to me is a significant issue. You should be able, even on an external drive, which you can with an Intel Mac, uh, enable File Vault and run uh, fi and have an entirely secured drive, whether it's internal or external. It's been so long since we were able to catch up with Glenn, and there were so many books and so much great information to have that we decided to break this conversation up into three parts. In part two, we continue our discussion of the M1 Max and some of the issues and challenges surrounding them and items that you may or may not run into until it's too late. So you definitely want to pay attention to this. We also then get into his uh, also latest book, Securing Your Mac, uh, which is a little less M1 specific, a lot more security based. And there are some surprising new security things that you can do or concerns that you should have if you care at all about security. That's next time on Mac Voices. Until then, and as always, I'm Chuck Joyner. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at BackbeatMedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at Cashfly.com.